Uh, greetings, uh, greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ uh, from Taipei, uh, Taiwan. Again, it's been a special joy to be a part of uh, the church's 50th Global Missions uh, Convention. And again, I want to especially thank Pastor Sam Reeves and colleagues for giving me this uh, wonderful opportunity uh, to be able to be with you and to be able to share a little bit of God's Word and what God is doing in missions in the 21st century. Uh, I indeed very much like the name of our church, Cross Culture Church of Christ. Uh, I think back to the church at Antioch uh, and what a wonderful picture, even before they sent out Paul and Barnabas or uh, who was still then known as Saul, Saul and Barnabas. Even before they sent them out, the church in Antioch was involved in cross-cultural missions. And I just think of Australia and uh, with the migration of people from literally uh, probably all across the world that the mission uh, missions is actually on our very doorstep. And even before we leave Australia, even before we leave uh, the city uh, in which we are at, uh, we can be involved in cross-cultural missions. And so my prayer is that the church would continue to be a blessing uh, right there uh, where the Lord has planted us and that right in, on our doorstep we would be involved in cross-cultural uh, missions And as uh, this missions convention concludes, uh, and we look forward to a coming year, although the pandemic, uh, we're not really quite sure what that will do, but certainly prayer is not hindered by pan the pandemic. Uh, being more informed about uh, missions uh, is not uh, influenced by uh, the pandemic, and certainly being involved locally. Uh, there are many, many opportunities. And so we want to be informed we want to intercede, uh, we want to be inspired, and we want to be involved uh, as well. And I want to, especially on behalf of OMF, to thank the church for the partnership that Cross Culture has with OMF. Uh, Pastor Reeves tells me that there are some seven, eight OMFers uh, that the church supports, and we're very thankful for that partnership that the Lord uh, has given to us. I'd like to uh, share with you on the topic of from success to significance. If you have your Bibles, would you just turn with me very quickly to the Gospel of Luke, uh, the fifth chapter of the Gospel of Luke. We have a wonderful description uh, that Luke gives to us here of the beginning of Jesus' uh, ministry. Uh, and we don't have time today, but uh, of course, if you're familiar with John's gospel, you know there at the very end of John's gospel in John chapter uh, 21, uh, there's a parallel passage uh, that is so very similar uh, to what Luke records for us here in the fifth chapter. Uh, and you can have, uh, take the opportunity perhaps to compare and contrast these two stories, these two events, one at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, also very much involved there at the Sea of Galilee, or here as it mentions the, the, the Lake of Gennesaret. Uh, it involves Peter, it involves catching uh, fish, and certainly it concludes also with Jesus calling upon Peter to follow him. And uh, I think there's a wonderful parallel there uh, that we need to keep in mind. But this morning, I'd, or the, today, I'd like to just very quickly focus uh, our thoughts on these short 11 verses that we have just read. Maybe before looking at them in detail, uh, I was especially struck with verse 1. Luke here describes for us the multitude pressing around Jesus, listening to the Word of God. And I especially notice this word pressing around him, pressing around Jesus. I, I went and did a word search of this word uh, in the original Greek language and uh, came to find out that this word appears just seven times in the New Testament. Uh, here it is translated as pressing around him, pressing around Jesus to hear the word of God. If you were to turn actually to Luke chapter 23, verse 23, uh, it actually is translated somewhat different there. It's translated as insistingly demanding. 
It was at the crucifixion or just leading up to the crucifixion of Jesus. And the crowd was insistently demanding. That word insistently is actually this word that is translated pressing here. And then it's translated again somewhat differently actually in Acts chapter 27 verse 20. Uh, where we have a wonderful description of Paul uh, being escorted by soldiers to Rome, and you'll be familiar with that story. Almost a whole chapter uh, devoted to describing that journey, and of course you remember that they encountered a great storm in that journey. And there, at ver in, ver in verse 20 of chapter 27, this same word is actually described as the storm and the waves raging about the boat that Paul and uh, those people were in. And I was just struck with the fact of, of how at the very beginning of this passage that we have just read, that there was a deep hunger by the crowd for the Word of God, to hear Jesus proclaim the Word of God. That they were pressing around him. That they were insistently demanding. And that in a sense almost raging. Desiring to hear the word of God. And I was just struck by that description. And, and certainly I wonder if that would be a description that would describe the day and age that you and I live in. Probably not. Probably not. That as we look at the world today, whether it's in Australia, uh, whether it's in other parts of the world, I don't think we quite see that kind of spiritual hunger and desire for the Word of God. Yet, it's actually very interesting if you have a chance to go back and, and read revival history throughout the church. Actually, even going back into the book of Acts to see people hungering for the Word of God. Hungering for the Word of God. Recently I read a book uh, describing something of a revival that took place in China in the 1920s. The book is entitled, The Half Can Never Be Told. The Half Can Never Be Told. And it describes of how a British missionary by the name of Paget Wilkes came to China or went to China. He was serving in Japan and, and he was invited by Christian workers in China to come to China to share the word of God. And so Paget Wilkes with his wife traveled to China. It actually came at a point in which uh, there was a lot of social unrest in China. There was very much an anti-foreign uh, kind of a sentiment in China at that point in time. And so here was this missionary, uh, a Western missionary, a Brit. He was coming from Japan, which was actually also uh, in a very tenseful relationship with China. And Paget Wilkes came. And that book goes on to describe something of God's work as Paget Wilkes opened the Word of God and there was such a spiritual hunger for the Word of God. And many, many people were converted under the ministry of Paget Wilkes during that time. And my prayer, brothers and sisters, is that in Australia, we would also see that kind of spiritual hunger that the Holy Spirit be at work in a new and in a fresh way in our midst. And that somehow really much sets the background to this passage that, that we have just read. And I'd like to just think very quickly with you from three areas as I read down through this passage. I want us to first of all notice that Peter's boat was used to proclaim the word of God. In verse 2, we're told of how Jesus saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake, but the fishermen had gotten out of them and they were washing their nets. And then notice what it says in verse 3. And he, that is Jesus, got into one of the boats, which is Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and began teaching the multitude from the boat. Peter's boat became a platform for the pro proclamation of God's word. Actually, if we go down through this passage, we will notice that this word boat actually appears several times in verse 2. It appears twice in verse 3 and then two more times in verse 7. 
And of course, we're familiar with the fact that Peter was a fisherman by trade. That was his profession. And so his boat very much was a symbol of his profession. And, and Jesus desired to use Peter's profession to use his boat as an instrument or as a platform to proclaim the word of God. And I think that has deep significance for us as we look at missions, especially in the 21st century, because as we look at missions literally across the world, uh, what we see is that there are many, many places where people or missionaries in that more traditional sense of the word, missionaries are not able to go and to serve and to be a witness for Jesus Christ. You can't get a missionary visa, actually, just in Asia alone. 80% of Asia's population lives where missionaries cannot go openly. And yet, if we look at those places, we would find that they are not closed, but rather they are open. They are open to Christians to go. Missionaries can't go, but Christians can go, and they can use their professions as a platform for the professing, professing of their faith. And I love that word profession in the English language. You'll know, of course, it means two things. One, it means your job. What is your profession? And if I was to ask, be asked that question, I would say I'm a president of a seminary. That is my profession. That is my job. But yet, isn't it interesting that this word profession also has the meaning of proclaiming, of speaking forth? And so, in a sense, a profession of our faith through our profession. A profession of our faith through our profession. And so we see, first of all, that Jesus wanted to use Peter's boat, his profession, as a profession of God's word, to proclaim God's word. And I believe today, brothers and sisters, that God also wants to use your talents and wants to use your training and your equipping and your background and your profession, whether it's there in Australia or perhaps in other places, that God wants to use your profession as a profession of faith. For several years, we had a wonderful brother from Brazil, actually a soccer or a football coach, who came and served with us uh, via his profession. And he had a wonderful opportunity as he mingled with young people in the city where he was serving to use his profession as a profession of his faith. The city was, uh, was excited that here was a Brazilian football or a soccer coach uh, in their midst. And uh, he was often asked, why have you come from Brazil to this place? And that opened up wonderful opportunities for him to share something of the faith of Jesus Christ. We had another uh, sheep farmer who was involved for 30 years, has it had his own sheep farm in New Zealand, and he came and partnered together with us, again using his profession as a profession of his faith. And so we see, first of all, that Peter's boat was used to profess or to proclaim God's word. But then, secondly, we see also, that Peter's nets were used to display God's power. And there's just several descriptions here that I think are very, very significant for us as we think of this passage. Obviously, first of all, I was struck by the fact that as Jesus finished teaching, he, he said to Peter, he said to Peter there in verse 4, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. And the challenge of faith, the challenge of faith that is given to us there, that he was called to go out into the deep and his faith would be challenged and yet God would also be found faithful. And so Peter answered and said, Master, we have worked hard all night and caught nothing. But then notice this phrase, but at your bidding, I will let down my nets. At your bidding, according to your word, so there was also that test of obedience. There was a test of faith going out into the deep. There was a test of obedience at the bidding of your word. And I just wonder, brothers and sisters, whether these days as we have gathered together for this, the 50th missions convention, whether the Lord has been speaking to you and whether you and I also are faced with that test of obedience 
I just think back to that passage that we have also already looked at of Philip there in Acts chapter 8 when that messenger of the Lord came to Philip and told him to get up and go. And what do we read? Philip got up and went. Philip got up and went. And so that obedience. And so there was a test of faith. There was a test of obedience. There was a test of lordship as well, wasn't there? It's interesting that twice over we see Peter talking here. There in verse 5, Peter answers and says, Master, we have worked hard all night and caught nothing, but at your bidding I will let down our nets. And then if you go down to verse 8, Peter said when he saw this net of fish, he fell at Jesus' feet saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. And so there was a lordship test as well. Peter went from knowing Jesus as a master or, or perhaps better translated as a teacher. He came to know Jesus as Lord. And so there was a lordship test in his life. Whether he was willing to surrender himself completely to the lordship of Jesus Christ. Somebody once said, if Jesus is not Lord of all, he is not Lord at all. And so there was a test of faith. There was a test of obedience. There was a test of the lordship of Jesus Christ. And in these verses, of course, we have a wonderful example of the power that was manifested through Peter's nets and the catch of fish that manifested that power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And my friends, it is as we journey through that test of faith, as we journey through that test of obedience, as we journey through that test of lordship or surrender, that the power of Jesus Christ will be manifested in our lives. And so firstly, there was the boat that proclaimed His word. Secondly, there was the nets that displayed His power. Lives, lastly, lives that fulfill His mission. One of the things that strikes me in this story is the partnership that we have between Peter, Andrew, James, and John. And actually, if you go down through this passage, they're referred to there in verse 7 as partners. Then in verse 9, they're referred to as companions. Verse 10, again, this word partners appears. And I think it's a wonderful reminder for us in the 21st century about the importance of partnership. Missions, Christian work is not about partisanship, but rather it is about partnership. A friend of mine reminded me actually uh, not too long ago of the importance of this word partnership in missions. He said to me, Jamie, as we look at missions in the 21st century, it's not about egos, it's not about logos, and it's not about silos. It's not about egos, it's not about logos, it's not about silos, but rather it's about partnering together, partnering together. And we have a wonderful example of that, don't we, don't we, don't we have it here? A wonderful example of that partnership. But then very, just very quickly, verse 10 and then into verse 11, Jesus said to Simon, do not fear, for now on you will be catchers of men. And so when they had brought their boats to the land, they left everything and followed him. First of all, we see the courage. Do not fear. Do not fear. What a wonderful three short word statement. Do not fear. Do not fear. And so there was this courage that came. But not only so, there was also consecration that they left everything. They left everything to follow him. And of course, there was that commitment, wasn't there? There was that commitment. And so here we have a picture of lives dedicated to the fulfillment of his mission. Dedicated to the fulfillment of mission. Lives that were no longer about earthly success, but rather about eternal significance. They were no longer about catching fish perhaps a symbol of success, but rather they were now about catching people, catching men and women for the kingdom of God. They were about eternal significance, eternal significance. And my thoughts go back to the story of Robert Jaffrey. Perhaps some of you might be familiar with Pastor Jaffrey's story, an early Christian missionary alliance missionary. 
uh, to China. He came from a very well-to-do family in Canada, in Toronto. His father had a very successful business and had, had all the intentions of actually uh, his son eventually taking over for him. And yet Robert Jaffrey felt that God was calling him to cross-cultural missions. And, and so even, uh, even in spite or despite the opposition of his parents, Eventually, thankfully, his parents came around, but a uh, very difficult journey. But he followed Jesus courageously to China. Incidentally, he was eventually greatly used by God in stirring up a mission vision for the Chinese church and was instrumental in actually uh, forming one of the very earliest cross-cultural mission agencies in the Chinese church called the Overseas Chinese Mission. The Overseas Chinese Mission. He went to the southern part of China, Robert Jaffrey, and, and became very, very fluent in Cantonese, which is spoken in the province of Guangdong, actually also a bit in Guangxi. And if you were to go to Hong Kong, it is also spoken there as well, Cantonese. He became very, very fluent in Cantonese. One day, Robert Jaffrey got a letter from... Uh, an American petroleum company called the U.S. Standard Oil Company, which was at that point in time one of the largest oil companies in the world, inviting him to actually head up their whole larger or their whole China operation. In that letter, they said, this is the amount, uh, the salary that we are going to give you. And it was a very significant am amount, much bigger than what he was getting from the CMA. But Robert Jaffrey wrote back and said he was not interested. They again came back to him and they said, uh, you make your own offer. You determine how much you want us to pay you and we will pay you that amount. To that, Robert Jaffrey responded to Standard Oil by writing back and saying to them that, well, your pay, your salary is big. Your job is too small. Your job is too small. And God went on to use Robert Jaffrey in an amazing way. A life fulfilling his mission, his life, his life fulfilling God's mission. From success to significance. From earthly success to eternal significance. And my prayer is that our boats, our professions would become platforms where his word is professed. That our nets, as we have that faith, that test of faith, as we have that test of obedience, as we have that test of surrender, that our nets will also be displaying His power. But also that our lives would be about fulfilling his mission, that our lives would be about fulfilling his mission, and that the Lord would help each and every one of us to move from earthly success to eternal significance.